Uh, I should just start by saying this: there are parts of this talk that are very speculative. Um, a lot of that has to do with the implications for PE. But I thought I would actually take this opportunity to talk about this particular subject because I have a captive audience of, especially observers, or people who work in observing magnetic fields. There's a lot of questions, and I'm hoping that after this talk, some of you will be able to answer some of them. Okay, so uh, what do I mean when I talk about uh, high magnetic field white dwarfs? I'm talking about white dwarfs that have at least a mega gauss field, um, but there are measurements of B fields for white dwarfs that go all the way up to 1,000 mega gauss. 10% of all white dwarfs are highly magnetized. It's actually fairly interesting, I think, that it's the same percentage for neutron stars. So 10% of neutron stars are magnetars with measured field strengths so of 10 to 14, 10 to 15 gauss fields. These are enormously magnetized uh, compact objects. So, uh, you can ask where did they come from, and you can ask this question. If the formation of high field magnetic white dwarfs is independent of binary evolution, then the fraction of high field magnetic white dwarfs in single stars should also be the same as it is in binary systems. But you can go out and you can actually look at the observations to see if this is true or not. Um, you can use SDSS, the Small Digital Scatter Survey. This is data release 7 from this year. SDSS identified about uh, 1,200 detached white dwarf and dwarf binaries. Not a single one was highly magnetized. It also identified 149 single high field magnetic white dwarfs. And you can ask the question should we have found some of those in binaries? Those in 20 parsecs, there are 109 white dwarfs, 20% of which have a main sequence companion. Um, so you can do the statistics and you can ask the question are these coming from the same underlying population? And if you calculate the maximum probability for that as binomial statistics, you get 5.7 times 10 to the minus 10, or 6.2 single result that they're coming from separate populations. So what options are you left with with that data? Um, well, we know that if you have a high field magnetic white dwarf, there's no detached companion present. And if you're a non magnetic white dwarf, or you just don't have a detection of a mega gauss field or above, uh, often there's a detachment companion present. So there are two options I came up with to explain this. One is that the presence of a detached long period companion somehow prevents you from creating a highly magnetized white dwarf. Uh, it's hard to envision a scenario where that is true, especially with some of these are very wide liners. Uh, the other option is that the orbiting companions were there, and then in the formation process they were destroyed. So somehow they were instrumental to the process of forming a high field magnetic white dwarf, but they were destroyed during that process. So this is more appealing to me. Um, and so uh, we came up with a scenario for this. Uh, my collaborators on this were Sarah, Sarah Rollins, who's an undergraduate that worked on this project, who's now a graduate school at Harvard, Dave Spiegel and Brian Metzger, and then Eric Blackman here. And we, uh, we came up with an analytic method in which you could create these, these heavy magnetized white dwarf systems where you start with a low mass companion and you destroy it during the process and I'll describe that. We published this actually in 2011 but I think it's relevant for p &E, or maybe relevant for p &E, uh, in the National Academies. So the first thing that I wanted to say, this is from a more recent paper of this year, is that um, you know, M dwarfs and planets are actually plentiful so they give you a source of these. We know that M dwarfs in particular uh, go through common low phases and emerge as most common envelope <coughs> binaries in short periods. There's a lot of information on this plot. Um, what you're showing over here on the side is the, uh, the orbital period downwards. And on this axis here, you're seeing the, the mass of the companion measured in Jupiter masses. And the colors actually describe where you should be able to find these systems. So the, the magenta region here is all possible places where you might expect. Uh, to find that dwarf that survived the common envelope phase. And out here, uh, in this region here, you don't have enough just like energetic arguments, you don't have enough energy to survive that process, so you wouldn't expect to find anything here. And if you get down into this region here, uh, what happens is that you get uh, gravitational disrupted, so you get tightly shredded from the core of the that was the proto-white dwarf. And if you plot, uh, if you plot all the known uh, M dwarf companions to white dwarfs that are post-common envelope, you can see them here. Uh, colors indicate the mass of the white dwarf. And they fit pretty well all during this kind of uh, region right here. So it all seems to be fairly reasonable. 
Uh, people have been asking about planets a lot too. Uh, planets are a source of any momentum. They are probably plentiful too. And so in this, in this particular paper, we looked at the fates were of the known planetary systems as of, this is a relevant as of probably three or four, four months ago. So we selected all planetary systems that had um, companions with masses at least Jupiter's and with a primary mass at least the Sun's. And we calculated out the evolution of the orbit to see what would happen to it. And so the red circles here show the sun major axis initially right now on the main sequence. And then um, the lines connect to where they go. So all these red guys here plunge into their host star at some point on one of the giant bridges and do not survive. So they're all destroyed. The blue dots out here show the systems which will um, not enter a problem globe. And in these cases, the orbits move out to the mass loss. Uh, Jupiter is right here. So if you were to look for uh, planetary companions to white dwarfs, you would want to start looking right here, which is about 8 to 9 AU, and you want to look out that way. That's where you would expect to find planetary companions to white dwarfs. So planets and M dwarfs um, can or count on looks, and we expect them to do that. And what happens, uh, what could happen when they do that is, that the companion then enters uh, when the star becomes a giant, it starts to spiral inward, and if the companion is low enough mass that it can't hold that process, it gets really close to the proto-white dwarf core down here, and then it gets tidal disrupted by the gravity of the, of the white dwarf core. Uh, during that disruption process, then, you've got the guts of the planet that then are kind of rotating around, smearing out, and they form a disk around the center. So the disk is actually inside the RGB or AGB star. Um, now, if you just have one companion, um, what happens is it's not enough to kind of blow this envelope off, so it just sits there and waits until this star loses mass through its normal processes to emerge a white dwarf. And our thought was that this disk, we looked into the physics of the disk itself, is a way to potentially um, generate these magnetic fields and create them onto the white dwarf surface so that when that white dwarf does emerge at the end of the AGB phase, it's emerging with very strong magnetic fields. And so the disk looks something like this. Uh, this is an accretion disk. It's actually slightly different from most accretion disks you'll encounter in um, astrophysics. The disk is very cold compared to the stellar ambient. So it's living inside the center of the star where the temperatures can be very extreme. Um, it's also very dense compared to the ambient itself. So what happens is, uh, the disk starts to accrete. When, when the disk, this disk forms, and if you just use a simple alpha disk model, what you find is that it, it's actually kind of in a hypercritical accretion state. And what that means is that basically photons are being infected with the flow, so they don't have time to fuse out the disk. Now, typically, in those kinds of disks, you find those types of disks around being neutron stars and black holes. Uh, in those types of disks, it's a very natural way to extract the momentum and keep the accretion flow going. And that has to do with uh, around neutron stars that just cool through neutrino losses. And in black holes, you can just evect everything to the event horizon, so you don't have to worry about it. But for a white dwarf, uh, you have to get rid of that. If you want the disk to, to keep uh, accreting and not halt that accretion, what you need to do is you need to get rid of that material some other way. And one way to do this is outflows. So the idea here is this kind of acts like a conveyor belt. Material goes in here very quickly and gets somewhat funneled out of here. Um, there was actually also a nice paper by a, a Barrow um, back almost so over a decade ago, I guess, that was looking at something similar to this, but subbing to the commission disks in a context for PN shooting. So it's, it's related to that. Okay, so you can make those estimates, and you can, um, the disk is ionized, susceptible to turbulence, and possibly MRI, things like that. So you can, you can kind of order magnitude and calculate what the magnetic field you expect from such a disk to be. And you see them, they look something like this. Um, for different assumptions about the um, viscosity of this, we get uh, field strengths going from a few uh, megagauss all the way up to about a thousand megagauss. So, and this is a function of companion mass here, so for various mass companions. The higher mass companion, the higher uh, magnetic field you can get out of this. So, um, this, let's not worry about this first point so much, I guess. Um, this is just to summarize a little bit of what, what I was just saying. Uh, the fields amplify in the disk, and then you hold that they are accreted down to the white dwarf surface, at which point then 
Um, they could diffuse out but the actual time scales for only to decay is it, very long compared to the AGB phase. So they should emerge, and if they get down all the way towards the cells and become anchored, then they'll live through the AGB phase all the way out to the side. Um, now, this was an analytic study, so um, there were some important caveats that we weren't so sure about. Um, and this is where some leaps of faith happen. So the first question is, how long does this survive? Because I remember I said that that disk itself is very cold compared to an extremely hot ambient of temperatures like 10.7, 7, 10 to 8K. So what can happen is when that disk is rotating and the star is not rotating so much, you can train really hot material from the ambient into the cold disk. And maybe that entrainment process just tears the disk apart very quickly, doesn't even get through a rotational period, doesn't have time to amplify the fields. That's one possibility. The other important caveat is that uh, hydrogen-rich material deposited in the helium burning layer could trigger some sort of thermal runaway, and that would explode the entire star itself. So, so we did some simulations of the first point to see if this would be expected to survive on longer time scales. Uh, this is a one Jupiter mass accretion uh, uh, disk. You're looking down on the disk here, and you're looking at the side of the disk here, which is showing density and temperature. This is also an astrophotic high division. For one Jupiter mass companion, the disk that goes quickly from some sort of thin disk into mixing in with the star itself, um, it still possesses any momentum, but it's more like some sort of hot kind of density in right here. We also have done this for other companions too. This is the same simulation, but for a 10 Jupiter mass accretion disk. And in this case, you can really see what I'm talking about. The hot material here is entraining on the disk and it's slowly bleeding the disk mass away. But this particular, these simulations show that the, um, these disks run at least on 10 rotation time, so it's plenty of time to amplify the field and, and push it down into the, into the white dwarf area. So this is something we're continuing to look at. So the takeaways basically I think are of this uh, tidal disruption of low mass companions inside the aging stars themselves could be a plausible way to create tidal magnetized white dwarfs. And the disk is dense and cold compared to the ambient, which differs from the typical accretion disk you see in astronauts. Uh, things I'm currently thinking about, and I would love comments on any of these. Um, uh, vertical ion momentum transported the disk, so there's a lot of shear in the vertical direction, so is that possible as a hydrodynamic mechanism to transport ion momentum without really magnetic fields? High mass analog, so this happens in a much more massive star. You could create basically a, a, a magnetized core that then if that star was above eight solar masses when it would undergo a core collapse. Uh, this flux freezing would, would produce a positive magnetar if it's high enough fields. Physics of the destruction event itself are starting to simulate this with Astrid here. Uh, the other thing is you have accretion onto a white dwarf, so no one was talking about Novi. So possibilities of possibly Novi in these kind of systems. And these are, I think, two, two possible Novi inside of PN. And then uh, the thing that I'm most interested in, I think, is if we found a mega gauss field or higher magnetic white dwarf inside of PN, you think that some bipolar PN come from common envelopes, and you think these things come from common envelopes, and you find one inside of PN, that's pretty interesting, I think. So I'll stop there, and uh, please talk to me if you have any thoughts on any of these. First, I want to uh, welcome Jason, uh, uh, because he came back to us. He, he went, uh, a little while ago, a cold collapse supernovae, but they even don't know how to explode the star. So, <laughs> questions? So, I don't, I don't really know a lot about the magnetohydrodynamics, so how exactly does your disk amplify the magnetic field? That's a good question. So, <coughs> if you want to amplify a field, you need some sort of source of energy, um, which typically will be energy in differential rotation, and possibly also energy in turbulence. You usually need both of those things to happen. So, through that process, the magnetic field can get stre like stretched out and then folded back and not itself. So, it's tapping the energy from those two sources and turning it into, into more magnetic field. Uh, if, if you want to look to, to learn, you can look at the people who are predicting the solar activity, the prediction is perfect, but what they do is actually change the prediction as observation report. It's amazing. You look at the solar activity, they have prediction for the next, I don't know, 20 years. You look five years later, and the observation are exactly like the predictions. 
But then you compare the two and you see that the prediction line actually is influenced by the so even people working on the sun, you know, it's how to know about dynamo activity exactly. But basically what it's saying with your differential rotation protection. Yes, it's a bug. Yes, that's an interesting point, which I didn't mention here at all. So the, the mass, the mass of the high magnetized wave doors, it depends which group you talk to, but they range from something a little bit more than the typical just field white dwarf distribution. So you know, averaging about 0 0.62 solar mass and 0 0.63, all the way up to about 0 0.8 uh, solar mass white dwarf. So there's been one other group that's tried to explain this kind of phenomenon too through merging merging white dwarfs, but I think in that case, well, A doesn't say anything about the SDSS statistics, and also it's hard. Then you need like 2.4 solar mass, you need a point, even if you're at that upward line end. So there is evidence that they're, they're slightly more massive, but exactly how much it is, it's not entirely clear. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so I have a couple of questions. So, firstly, does um, the, uh, the number of Magnetized white dwarfs that we see, does that fit with the the, the rate of planet detections? You know, Jupiter, or Jupiter max planets? Because, I mean, every, every star has a planet, right? But you say only 10% of these things have. Right, so this is also another great point, too. So I think what, what could kill this kind of scenario is the actual statistics. So if you get really good statistics for the amount of companions around main sequence stars, and you believe those, and it's either way more, or, or it's, I guess in the worst case scenario, it's not enough. That definitely will kill it. It's way more than maybe some subset of these for whatever reason don't do this, or maybe it's some, something else. But that's that's a really good point. And then my second question would be: Are you basically trying to tell me that if we keep looking, given how difficult it's been to find any kind of magnetic field in a central star of a planetary nebula, are we going to find the Giga Gauss? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, so I mean, they find these things in the field, right? That I guess it's all Zeeman, but if you put it inside something that has a lot of gas or in some nebula, I don't know if that makes it a, impossible to find it or, or what. Maybe Joel would say something. About it. I'll just say the helix central star. You know, it's got an unexplained hard X resource, okay. and no binary companion, as David others have mentioned. So, no, no detectable binary. Companion. You may have said this in this talk, so forgive me if not. Did you give a mass, a rough estimate of the mass of, the, of these disks? Oh, uh, yeah, so the, they depend on whatever companion we use. So for this one, it's a 10 Jupiter mass accretion <laughs> disk. Now, in, in reality, well, in a more, a better theoretical picture, the, the companion will come in and kind of get torn apart somehow. Maybe some of that mass gets lost. So I'd say these are like, if you're disrupting this companion, this is like the most mass you would possibly have in the disk. Okay. The second question is, uh, you talked about the lifetimes, but uh, do you expect there is any chance that they will survive? No, I don't think space? it would be really interesting if they lived all the way through the AGB phase and came out on the other side, but um, at least in, I, I, mean, I don't really know what my suspicion based on what this is, and then just basic uh, this is spreading, if it really is some sort of alpha disk with a reasonable value of alpha, then it, it visibly spreads and makes sense very quickly. Uh, if, and even these, if you can calculate out just from this, the bleeding away, it's, it's pretty fast. So it would then 10 to 100 times faster than even the HD things would. The question, I think, was going to ask the same as David about the statistics. Okay, so summary this talk is emphasizing the merger possibility, and we will meet 5.30 and then have discussion at 45.